so this is a weird kind of impromptu webcast with a with an impromptu guest. And <laughs> Jake, I, I was talking with you about this on the phone this morning. It seems like every four years we we have to do something like this. Every three to four years, um, like you were talking about GitHub lateral movement and those types of things. There's all of these new amazing offensive techniques that come up and really creative stuff, and that's great. But we constantly have this pressure in the industry where you have these vendors and VC funding. It's like we can totally automate penetration testing, and then we don't need penetration testing anymore, and our company will be worth billions of dollars. And we fight it all the time. So I wanted to kind of go through this presentation, and it's going to be kind of a history lesson because we are talking, you know, we're all old, old dudes in the industry. And I want to start way back in time and um, kind of setting up, oh, sorry, not back in time yet, but I want to do a quick definition check. And the reason why I want to do a definition check is because we have to define what the hell we're talking about because. I think you'd agree with me, like the industry throws penetration testing around way too much um, as far as like knowing what a pen test is and what a penetration test is not is really, really, really hard. So when we're talking about these things, I want to set it up and get your opinion on this here in a second. Vuln scan is literally that. You're running mm -hmm. a vulnerability scan, you're looking at the results and you're fixing the issues. It's not that it's crappy. It's not that it doesn't provide value. It just is what it is and it provides the value. Pen test is usually defined as one step up at a bare minimum that involves some level of exploitation to articulate risk to the organization. Mm -hmm. you then get to a red team, and a red team is where you're doing adversarial emulation. You're coming in stealthy. Your goal is not to enumerate a huge number of vulnerabilities, but really exercise the blue team and their ability to detect. And a purple team is collaborative, like where you're working together with, uh, with the blue team. And you're working on it. We can get into another type of test, which we'll discuss here in a second. But when you're talking about compliance, when we're talking about PCI and HIPAA, and you may know some additional compliance standards that because there's like hundreds of them, they pretty much just define a pen test. They don't differentiate between a red team pen test or a pen test pen test. They just say pen test. Is that kind of what you're seeing, or you know of any other standards that may define it a little bit differently? I can't think of a single regulatory standard that defines it well and, you know, or defines it beyond saying penetration test. And, and honestly, man, imagine, you know, the folks writing these standards and their confusion when we oh. can't even agree in the industry. Yep. Right. Well, and you and I have talked to the people that create these standards. And I feel like for a lot of the people that create these standards, you, you and I don't want to rip on anybody. I might describe someone and someone may get offended, but a lot of these people really don't have much experience actually doing technical offensive things. They don't even really have experience doing forensics or working IR, but they have really entrenched philosophies on computer security that aren't necessarily grounded in reality. I guess I didn't pull any punches there at all. I just went right in. Um, and yet they just kind of throw around these definitions without actually consulting the industry. And further, they don't define them in their documents. Like they literally are like, you should get a pen test once a year without actually clearly defining what that actually means, right? Yeah. I mean, if I can, you know, maybe offer at least like a little bit of a, a, the other side of that, um, you know, I, I had a chance this, uh, this summer to do some policy work with, with a very large NGO um, and, uh, you know, international, uh, you know, basically international policy on, on vulnerable reporting or policy frameworks on vulnerable reporting. Um, and, I, I had a chance to finally see how the sausage was made. Um, you know, a couple of things. Uh, first off, it is way harder than, than it looks from the outside. Um, yep. but, but secondarily, um, it was a public service. And this isn't me tooting my own horn here, right? The honorarium, right, did not cover my travel expenses, let alone my time. Um, yeah. And so, and that's apparently typical, right? Yep. Um, you know, and so there's, you know, I, I feel for the folks that are involved in that. Bear in mind, right, most of them are doing it as a public service as well. And I'll throw out there that that doesn't necessarily um, always get you then the uh, uh, exactly the people you want writing those standards. How about exactly. That? Right. Exactly. Um, so with that, whenever I'm talking about a pen test, I want you to think of the broad universe of pen testing. I'm dealing with pen testing that's just above a vulnerability scan. I'm talking about red teaming. I'm talking about the universe of penetration testing. And this definition becomes really, really, really important because who's actually setting the standard of what these definition mean, definitions mean matter quite a bit. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, but let's, let's, let's go back in time. All right. 
Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of history. All right. So both Jake and I are IONS faculty and IONS is an amazing organization. It's basically the Avengers of information security. And one of those people at IONS that is like a, like a crazy big brother, like the big brother who you're constantly sneaking into his room to steal his music and he's yelling at you and he, and he beats you up periodically is Marcus Ranum, right? Um, absolutely. Uh, like, like I said, I love the guy. He's clearly, uh, insane in all like kinds of beautiful ways. And years ago, Marcus Ranum kind of created the first toolkit to create a firewall. He hates it when people say he invented the firewall, but in all reality, he created the tools and he did it for the white house. I think was one of the first ones, uh, that actually went up and immediately after firewalls started rolling out. Okay. You need to understand that back in that time, people like Jake and myself would be in meetings and we'd have conversations with people. And then they started saying things like, we don't have to patch. We don't have to do security. This is a new paradigm. And that's how people looked at the firewall was this magical thing that you could put in front of your sensitive assets. It would be a shield against all attacks. It would protect you from absolutely everything. And everybody reduced their overall security and they got complacent for lack of a better word. Now, Marcus, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, I don't know his exact words because he said it to me a number of times, um, but um, basically what he said was, I created this thing and then you bastards went and shot a hole right through the middle of it in port 80 and port 443. And his point was what he created wasn't supposed to be a panacea for all things in computer security. It was literally meant to be another defensive point that we actually put in place. So if we're looking at this from a really long historical perspective, we see these cycles that happen in computer security where something new happens, whether it's a firewall going all the way back to firewalls. And now all of a sudden we don't have to do security, whether it's moving to cloud computing. And if you remember, a huge part of cloud computing was great. Now we don't need as many security people, systems administrators, and we, you, you just look at all the costs you're going to save by moving to the cloud. And I think the cloud has some definite benefits to it. But all that bullshit about not having to spend as much money and needing as many people was wrong, right? And insanely so, right? And yes. you, you and I were calling it at the time. Um, it sounds it sounds ridiculous that anybody today would be like, we're going to move to the cloud so we can get rid of security assets. And you're like, it's what? like we're moving to the cloud. Now we need more security people. Well, like, and dude, you right? remember, um, I won't say who, but we were out at dinner once um, at a conference. And one of the people was talking about how their company was laying off something like 70% of their IT staff because they migrated to the cl to the cloud. And but that was disruptive. Oh, another one that was a disruptor, outsourcing. All of a sudden mm -hmm. all the IT jobs in America were completely irrelevant because they were going to outsource everything to India. And I remember working at Accenture at the time and they spun up these big Indian uh, dev shops and those in the Indian dev shops worked hard. They had some amazing developers. But they kind of overtaxed it. And they didn't understand communication. There was not a lot of, you know, like good practices. And it was another thing that just absolutely burnt the hell out of people. Mm -hmm. So we see this again and again and again. When new technology comes out and all of a sudden everyone thinks all bets are off. And I kind of blame, I just saw the glass onion. I don't know. Have you seen that yet, Jake? No, I haven't yet. You have to see it. It's okay. amazing. Um, it's a sequel to Knives Out. And Edward Norton's character is basically like the Elon Musk billionaire. And he's always walking around talking about, I like disruptors and disrupting the industry. And these are all disruptors. And, we're disru and you hear this bull constantly where this is a disruptive technology and it's brand new. And we have to deal with that again and again and again. A little bit of history, and this is getting real close to friends and family. Um, but Jake, correct me if I'm wrong. It's been a long, long, long time. Um, yep. with core impact. So oh, yeah. years ago when they first came out and I need to make this abundantly clear, core impact was one of the coolest companies on the face of the planet. I'm mm -hmm. not going to name any people that worked there because I haven't talked to them and gotten their permission, uh, to say that, but they were so awesome as an instructor. We got free licenses. They were taking our feedback on how to make the product better. Um, it, some of the best techs in the industry were working. It, it was an amazing product. So what did it do? It automated pen testing. It could literally take vulnerability scanning and it could take those vulnerability scan results, find vulnerabilities that it could exploit, and then it would exploit those. But 
When I say it automated pen testing, I should say it automated parts of pen testing, right? And a lot of the people that we dealt with, Jake and I dealt with all the time, were super cool about it in their presentation. They were always saying things like, this isn't trying to replace a pen test. This is trying to automate the mundane parts of it, trying to make it easier to do the assessments and all those things. But it, at some point, there was a shift in mood and focus in the core. And a bunch of our friends moved on. And all of a sudden, they were running around and they were talking about automation of an entire pen test methodology again. And lots of executives believed it at the time. So if you're on this webcast and you work for a company that does automated penetration testing, I want, you to make, I want to make this very painfully clear. You are not new. You are not a disruptor. You are not an amazing precious snowflake. You are the third or fourth iteration of the same thing that keeps coming back again. Okay? It's like Groundhog um, Day. It's Groundhog, Groundhog Day. All again. Uh, right? And I, and I know, Jake, I don't want to call out specific companies because you know that's their livelihood. And I just called out Core Impact. But like I said, a lot of the people have moved on. I think their help net security is who owns it now. Mm -hmm. So it's not even the same company. But when you first saw this, well, the thing I wanted to ask you is I remember going out to dinner with the people at Core and all the pen test instructors that we were teaching with at the time. And I, rem I, I never was really afraid. Like using the tool and seeing what it actually did, I never really got to the point where I was like, oh yeah, well, that's the end of our career. We're screwed. And I wanted to kind of get your take on like, all, like this tool and you got to know them as well as I did. Like when this was hitting the market, like what were your thoughts on it? Well, I, I think, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll echo with what you said, right? First and foremost, there was never a spot, whether it's this, whether the number of times I've heard that something is going to like, you know, you're out of a job tomorrow, pen testing is, is done. I mean, it, it's, it's just cyclical. There was never a spot where they introduced this to me where I was like, oh, I, I'd better update my resume. Um, that's definitely where I want to get into, you know, forensics and instant response or something. I mean, that happened, but, but that's a whole separate yeah. story, right? Um, but, uh, but no, I mean, there was never a spot where I thought this is going to take my job. Right. So yeah. ever, ever, but I look at it as a tool to enable me to go do cool stuff. Right. Yes. If you can automate the mundane stuff that frees me up to go do more cool stuff um, mm. that, that you can't automate. Yeah. And like I said, there was definitely a change. A lot of the people that were there are no longer there. And I want to make that clear. But this is this isn't even the first time uh, that somebody was talking about automation of penetration testing. I think I think was it the guy at Saint? Yes. Yeah. There was a while before Core Impact. So a little bit of background. Vulnerability scanners back in the day, we had Saint, we had Sarah, and then we had Nessus. Okay. Um, there's another one called Sait. We it never really became anything, really. Um, and at Saint, uh, the gentleman, and I can't remember his name, he was was basically baking exploitation right into the vulnerability analysis as well. So I think that that was the first major dig and cut against uh, like offensive stuff. And then we had Core Impact. So that was generation two. And then there was another generation between Core Impact and the current um, as well. But we've seen this, right? And, and it's always kind of doing the same thing, right? It's taking scan results and it's exploit exploiting those scan results. Now, it may get more creative. It may get better at doing that. But at its heart, that's what it's actually doing, right? It's taking known vulnerabilities, looking for those known vulnerabilities, exploiting those known vulnerabilities, and then generating a report as to how successful it was in exploiting those. And even Core Impact, dude, it was cool. Like I remember if you could get yeah. an implant on a system, it would automatically pivot through that system and exploit other systems. Mm -hmm. And you could automatically have it crawl through the network. And it, 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 it was cool. Like it was really, really, really super cool. Um, their spear phishing stuff was pretty solid as well. So there was a lot of really cool things in this framework. But like you said, I never woke up one morning and I was like, well, crap, um, that's it. Right. I'm out of the career. Well, um, if I may too, right? I, I suspect you've bumped into this as well, right? Where folks have used these frameworks and that's actually turned them off to a lot of vulnerability scanning because they turn right. around like, but it's going to break our stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And the one thing I'll say about today, we, we have a lot better understanding of how to write stable exploits and, and even a better definition of what stable means than, than we did, you know, 10 plus years ago, right? But it's, yeah. Anyway. It's yeah, it's yeah, but but even getting beyond the exploits and corrupting mm -hmm. an operating system and looking at post exploitation activities, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit, um, that's still dangerous. And I want to circle back to that. 
Yes. A little bit more history, right? I said this is in three parts, a rant in three parts. We're in the past. So we're still in the past. It got so bad at one point in uh, 20, like 19 to 2020 that there was a bunch of scanning vendors that were basically saying that they could do the equivalent of a PCI pen test through a scan. And what this was, was PCI DSS required an ASV scan where you could scan for vulnerabilities and we can have a whole nother conversation about how insane that was. But you require the scan and then there was a bunch of ASVs that were basically saying, look, if you run a scan, we call that a pen test and you can run a scanner and technically it's a pen test. You don't have to spend money on a pen test. It got so bad in the finance industry and in credit card that a PCI 3.0, they put this in and I had to dig a little bit to try to find this, right? Penetration testing is a manual process that goes deeper than automatic vulnerability scanning. And it is done by experts in their business. Penetration testers specifically look for security issues that automated scanners cannot identify and exploit these vulnerabilities when they find them. And I, I, my meme game, I, I just, I usually don't say much. I love my meme on this one. Um, this was, I, I was, I was inspired all the way down to the, uh, the, Comic Sans, but what you got, Jake, on this? I, I want to make sure that you know. Look, we've been around a long time. We we both been in the 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 absolute you know poop show that is is PCI DSS, right? Um, and and you know certainly uh, on that side, I want to make sure that everybody understands. You know, particularly for some of the newer folks in the audience, this is not written by somebody who's trying to protect penetration testing libelists. This reads like something me or John would have written, right? Yes. Um, th this is the PCI council writing the standard. These are folks that un that literally their whole job is to um, ensure well these right standards that help ensure the security um you know of of their of their covered entities right um and and again the, the fact that they wrote this is telling you not not me or john right that they wrote this should be telling you something and and the reason why i'm bringing this out jake is i do i do have these fears and you and i have talked about it about who defines what and how things are stabilized right like the idea of certifying someone like what is a certifying body and, you know, what is a certification worth versus another certification, um, Crest certification for companies in Europe and all of these things, right? And I'm always terrified of like PCI stepping in like they did with ASV and saying, this is what you have to do to be a vulnerability scanner. You have to be approved by us, pay us $20,000 for an attempt, and then them doing the same thing for a penetration testing. That scares me, right? And the other thing that scares me is I know that a lot of the companies in the automated pen testing side of the house, they have deep pockets with a lot of VC funding. They can get involved in these conversations of what defines a pen test. And I'm calling this quote out specifically for you all to remember that this quote is in here. And if PCI puts out like a pre-draft version of whatever standards coming out next, we have to make damn sure that this stays in there. And I'm not saying this as a Luddite coming across the hills to smash your loom. I'm doing this because this is absolutely essential for the way that we function in a total IT security industry, right? So that's a little bit more history. Um, anything else on PCI? I don't want to get into the password complexity stuff because I no, get sidetracked. No. I mean, that, right? I just apologize. I choked a little bit when you were talking about Crest. I was okay, you know, having okay. like that. Yeah, which is understandable, get, of course. Right? I'm already. I'm just racking it up. I'm gonna get hate mail from PCI. I'm gonna get hate mail from people in Crest. I'm get hate Bring it mail. on, baby. Bring it just, on. Just right? go to Reddit and complain on there, right? So I can ignore you properly. 